evening and welcome. Um, I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning, and I want to thank you all for being here. Today's presenter is Christopher Dant. He is a local writer and photographer who previously worked with the great landscape photographer Ansel Adams in Carmel, California. Dant's work has been part of exhibits in California where he taught photography for the Ansel Adams Friends of Photography workshops. In 2016, his black and white landscape photographs were shown in a juried exhibit at the Southern Vermont Arts Center. And he has previously given talks and writing workshops for us at Green Mountain Academy. We're very delighted to have him here with us again. Thank you, Christopher, for being our guest speaker. Thank you. You can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, let's start. This is a, a very large uh, topic and a lot of <clears throat> considerations. So um, it's uh, not cherry picking, but selecting what I think are some of the great moments in photography and some of the greatest photo photographers in the history of photography. And as a photographer and having worked with one of the great, great, greats who I'll talk about, Ansel Adams, I've always been interested in the art form and its history uh, and its cultural implications. And especially its power to influence people and affect change in the direction of <clears throat> wars and laws, ideas, governments, through public outreach. After all, really, you know, you can't really uh, be unmoved by seeing things like Matthew Brady's famous photographs of dead soldiers on the Gettysburg battlefield or a war-torn President Lincoln um, and other images of wars throughout history the triumph and misery of a pandemic, which we're going to see, um, the Great Depression, which we'll examine, worldwide famines, the horror of people in fires, tornadoes, disasters, those living in slums, or just people caught up in a terrible or triumphant moment that moves us uh, to hope or despair, or as we will see the sheer beauty of our natural world and its people. So to begin, um, you know, talk a little bit about photography as an art form. Um, as we know it today, uh, it, it's, it, did, it started out as art and not photography. Um, <clears throat> and relatively recently in the early 1800s and especially in the last century, photographers recorded the world around them. Stopping time, documenting moments, giving the viewer a moment in history that would last forever. Photographers realized that their images had the power to, you know, unite people and ignite change and have been a tool for social good in many cases. Some have even started movements, which uh, many of which endure today. Some images were unplanned. Um, they, 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 you know, they're, they're just happened at the moment made by relatively unknown photographers. Uh, yet many notable intentional images were produced by photographer artists that became famous and near the turn of the century influenced the direction of photography as art. And we'll talk a little bit about that because I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, idea that a lot of people don't realize. So let's begin with a few unplanned but famous images you'll likely have seen but from photographers you most likely have never heard of. And we start with this one. This is VJ Day in Times Square, 1945. This is Alfred Eisenstadt's unplanned photograph of a sailor, his name is George Mendonca, kissing Greta Friedman at the moment World War II had ended. It was uh, announced over the loudspeakers. Uh, Eisenstadt was in New York recording the moment and he whipped around and saw this thing happening and he got the picture. Greta was actually a dental hygienist and uh, George Mendoza was engaged to another woman that he was with the day who watched his fiance kiss another woman. George later said that he grabbed someone dressed like a nurse because he was incredibly great, grateful to all the war nurses who had taken care of the wounded. <clears throat> this photograph was published uh, on the cover of Life magazine, became the face of the war ending and since the 1950s, it endured in popular culture throughout the world, still does. Uh, it spurred movies, video games, and even a 25 foot statue that was erected in 2015, which is displayed where the kiss began. And both Greta and George became public figures, guests of honor and interviewed widely by major media outlets throughout the world. This is um, 
Joe Rosenthal's photograph of the Marines raising the American flag on Iwo Jima that inspired a nation during World War II. And I know you've all seen this great photograph as the flag was hoisted, uh, declaring victory on Iwo Jima, the horn sounded from the invasion fleet out into the, in the Pacific and soldiers fired their guns and screamed uh, joy. The photograph spurred a book, and as many of you may know, the 2006 movie called Flags of Our Fathers. And until his death at age 94, Joe Rosenthal defended what was alleged by many as a phony picture. It was a very big controversy, and it's actually um, <clears throat> discussed in Flags of Our Fathers. And after inquiry by military officials and Life magazines, the news editor finally concluded that it was an authentic news picture. But the rumor persisted today, despite the fact that this photograph is the most reproduced and parodied image in the world. This is Earthrise 1968, taken by astronaut Bill Anders on Christmas Eve as the Apollo 8 spacecraft rounded the dark side of the moon for a fourth time. The great nature photographer no longer with us, Galen Rowell, declared this as the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. It is one of the most famous pictures in photographic history. Anders, the astronaut, said, well, we set out to explore the moon and instead we discovered the Earth. The photograph inspired songs, a U.S. postage stamp, scenes from movies, and captured the imagination and wonder of everyone in the world. It changed really how we viewed our world. We had never seen the perspective of our planet before like this, and it helped spark <clears throat> the environmental movement and drew attention to climate change. And then two photographs by AP journalist, photojournalist Richard Drew in 1968, and then again in 2011, shocked the world. And I'll warn you, some of these are not easy to look at, some of these photographs, but they're iconic and famous images. The first one was when Drew was first covering the 1968 victory speech of Robert Kennedy, when he heard what sounded like firecrackers. Only feet away, uh, Drew said, I turned and stood frozen as the assailant emptied his weapon into uh, Kennedy. I turned back to see RFK sink to the floor and I made my photos. The grainy shadowed image would really reflected the symbolic darkness of that moment in our his nation's history, really in, at that year, it was a horrible year, and became the most viewed photograph of 1968 and really one of the most famous in history. Then it was 43 years later that Richard Drew shot what became the most controversial image ever taken. This is called Falling Man, and it was in the moments after the September 11th, 2001 attacks, as one poor man's desperate escape from the collapsing buildings. The image was published by many newspapers on the following day uh, of the attacks, and it was received with such recoil that the editors were called to apologize and detract it for its inclusion. And almost immediately it fell under obscurity, um, which in the 19 years since 9-11 has been slowly lifted. The photograph inspired a novel, a song, a documentary movie called Falling Man. And of any other 9-11 photographs, this one in particular moved the nation and President Bush to action. Later, millions of people wanted to know who this man was. And he was identified by his brother as Jonathan Briley, a 43-year-old sound engineer who worked at Windows of the World on the top of the World Trade Center. But one particular quite shocking photograph still remains buried in our memory and helped end war. This is Napalm Girl, 1972 in June. Associated Press photographer Nick Ut was outside a small Vietnamese, Vietnamese village when the South Vietnamese Air Force mistakenly dropped an napalm on that village. Nick was taking pictures of the bombing and suddenly out of the smoke, he saw a group of children and soldiers with a screaming naked girl running up the highway towards him. Nick helped the girl get treatment. He actually poured water on her and got her to the hospital and saved her life. The image was immediately released throughout the world and President Richard Nixon actually saw it and was shocked and he wondered if a photo was fake. Nick Wood told him, the horror of Vietnam War recorded by me did not have to be fixed. 
the Pulitzer uh, Committee agreed and awarded its top prize, the Pulitzer Prize, to uh, Nick Ut. America's involvement in the war ended not long after this photograph was published. Nick said, this terrified nine-year-old girl is still alive today and has become an eloquent testimony to the authenticity of the photo. It has ultimately changed her life and mine. The girl, whose name is Fan Fuk, gained international recognition and her story spurred books, The Girl in the Picture and Fire Road, and documentaries uh, that were famous at the time. She was awarded in 2019 the Dresden Peace Prize in recognition of her work with UNESCO and as an activist for peace. Today, she lives in Toronto with her two children and you can see her on the lower right there with one of her babies and her horribly disfigured back. But nothing really brought the Vietnam War home more dramatically than a photograph taken by an unknown photo, a school photojournalism major in 1970. This is Mary Ann Vecchio kneeling next to the dead body of student Jeffrey Miller. He was shot by the National Guard in Ohio during uh, the war protest at Kent State University. And everybody has seen this photograph. The young girl has a look of horror on her face and it was the face that launched a thousand protests. And it was the face that really mirrored the nation's shock that American soldiers would actually fire into a crowd of unarmed students. And it was a face that many, more than anything else, had turned America against uh, the Vietnam War. And this image flooded the media and landed on the front page of the New York Times and covers of Newsweek, Time, and Life. And it remains the most reproduced photograph in history. These, these photographs that I just showed you and many other enduring images, and there, I could have filled up an hour with showing you them all, have really shaped history, perceptions of ourselves, uh, and buried, uh, remain buried in our memory. But really to truly understand the influence of photography um, uh, historically um, on art, one has to delve into several famous photographers I'm gonna talk to you about that really changed photography as an art form and produced some of the most iconic images that remain with us today. And one really has to start with this man, Alfred Stieglitz. He was the famous American photographer and modern art promoter who was instrumental over his 25 uh, year career, I'm sorry, 50 year career in making photography an accepted art form. In addition to his photography, Stieglitz was also known for promoting art and photography in New York art galleries in the early part of the 20th century where he introduced many avant-garde European photographers and artists to the US. Um, I'll talk more about this, but at that time, photography was not accepted as any sort of art form at all. In fact, it was denounced. And uh, we'll talk about how uh, Stieglitz and people beyond him uh, helped make it an accepted art form. This particular photograph of him was taken by Imogen Cunningham, who is a famous photographer we won't discuss, and it became famous in the 1930s. Um, many of the photographers uh, uh, were photographed actually by yep, young up and coming photographers. They're sometimes their uh, you know, students, as we'll see. It was really the beginning of pictorialism um, uh, making photographs appear like paintings. Um, Stieglitz is standing here in front of one of uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's paintings and he was married to Georgia O'Keeffe and we'll see more of her as we go on. So this first one is a beautiful, I think, example of pictorialism. It's called The Wet Day on the Boulevard, Paris. This was taken in 1897. And during the 19th century, the international movement known as pictorialism represented both a photog photographic aesthetic and a set of principles about photography's roles as art. Pictorialists believe that photography should be understood as a vehicle for personal expression on par or equal to the other fine arts, like painting. So denouncing the new Kodak camera snap shooters and formulaic commercial photographers, the pictorialists proudly defended themselves as true artists, those who pursued, pursued photography out of a love of art, like Stieglitz. 
to challenge the notion that photography was merely an automated process inferior to painting, the pictorialists manipulated their images. They smeared Vaseline on the lenses. They scratched the negative. They intentionally blurred the image and uh, invented new techniques, many of which uh, are in use today, um, uh, historically. Um, and I'll talk about those in a minute. The soft focus of this Stieglitz image distances the viewer from the scene, uh, from the uh, scientific object objectivity associated with photography and suggested as the artist's interpretation of the scene rather than uh, the actual photograph, much like a painting would be. This one is called Night Reflections, New York City, 1897, the same year. <clears throat> Another famous example of pictorialism using a highly technical process called photogravure, in which it was invented actually in Italy, in which Stieglitz etched a copper plate that would hold the photographic image. And it gave it a really nice deep tonal range and deep dreamy quality that this has that accentuated the gas lights on the streets and the reflections on the wet, on the wet uh, streets of New York. And I show this photograph because um, it's a beautiful example of pictorialism and this is an actual photograph. This is actually a portrait of Edward Steichen, 1903, another uh, contemporary of Stieglitz. The two men made this portrait together using a technique called gum bichromate uh, a lot of uh, photographers still use this. Uh, it's a really beautiful way of producing a photographic image. And uh, it lent itself uh, to the pictorialist uh, movement because you could paint the surface chemicals and form brush strokes right on the photograph. So while Steichen, who is shown in this photograph as both a painter and photography, he chose to represent himself with a palette and brush not with a seemingly more technical tool of the camera, modeling his belief that successful fine art photography could be achieved only through painterly handicraft and compositional mastery. And here is Georgia O'Keeffe, 1918, a Stieglitz photograph. And she was nearly 24 years younger uh, than him and gaining recognition as a great painter she made an immediate impact on Stieglitz, both artistically and emotionally. And over the course of his life, he photographed her some three to 400 times. We never, I'm sure how many. He said, I am now back to my work. This time, no gimmicks. My new image of Georgia is so sharp that you can see the pores on her face. And yet it is abstract. And so this began a journey away from pictorialism to straight photography made famous later by Ansel Adams and others uh, in what his group was called the F64. It was a, a revolt against pictorialism using sharp focus, close up, clear images, no more smearing Vaseline on the lens. The revolt away from pictorialism was really strongly championed by this man, Paul Strand. He's one of the great photographers of the 20th century and his work greatly influenced Ansel Adams who came uh, after him for the emphasis on his sharp focused objective images of the 20th century. Uh, of all the great photographers, Strand really truly embodied the aspirations uh, and spirit of his age. And for more than 60 years, he created photographs that are a result of concentration on essentials, purity, precision in a form that sustains these qualities and lasting influences. And his photographs have a lasting influence. And probably his most famous photograph is this, Wall Street, New York, 1915. It is recognized by collectors and scholars as an icon of modernism, an image that redefined the art of photography. It's famous for its reliance on the sharpness and contrast of the shapes, uh, the, the shadows, the angles, created by the buildings and the workers that led to his abstraction. This world famous image is a platinum palladium print, which um, Paul Strand used almost exclusively, which is an absolutely beautiful goldish uh, brown image that is uh, different than a, plat a, a silver print that you see today, or at least you saw it, uh, in the era of Ansel Adams. And it stands really as one of the most reproduced masterworks of photography and is considered one of Strand's most famous works and an example of his change from pictorialism to straight photography. 
This seemingly uninteresting photograph um, is called Port Shadows, 1968, uh, 16. And it actually is one of his most famous because it ins was inspired by the European avant-garde and the Cubists, um, <clears throat> especially. That Strand wanted to show that all good art is abstract in nature. And he began to explore the question of what does a picture consist of? How are the shapes related to each other? And how do I, how do I, can I fill the spaces? It was the beginning of straight photography using sharp focus, even though it was abstract, it was sharp. And this is a um, young boy, Gondeville, France, 1951. <clears throat> One of Paul Strand's black and white portraits, a uh, very, very famous photograph. Um, this French teenager picture sears itself into your eyes. He stares and flinchingly back at you and there, <clears throat> you almost feel scalded by his exceptional beauty and the piercing intensity of his gaze. <clears throat> his chiseled features, his Roman nose, his curled lips and shock of hair. He really could be his classic Greek sculpture. St Strand ended up spending weeks um, in one place, getting to know the area and all of its people before taking a single shot. And it was the first portrait of its kind because he got to know this boy. He got to know who he was, his family, where he lived. And this was his resulting image. And it really changed photography because never before was um, a, a, uh, a portrait taken like this. Now we we'll move on to a man named Edward Steichen. Uh, who is a giant in the history of photography and along with Stieglitz is probably the most recognized American photographer in the early 1900s. He played a decisive role in establishing images as art along with Steichen. He used his prestige and art, uh, artistic uh, ability to gain acceptance, especially in advertising, fashion and documentary photography as artistic genres. And we'll show you a little bit of his fashion really a fabulous fashion photographer. This wonderful photograph really is taken by the famous portrait photographer, Josef Karsch, who we'll discuss later. And he photographed many of these photographers. Um, there's a wonderful one of Ansel I'll show you in a minute. Steichen's uh, probably most famous photograph is this pictorialist image uh, that was first used by Alfred Stieglitz in his New York City gallery in 1905 and it rose to fame uh, worldwide in the 1900s. This is the flat iron, 1904. And the image recalls the paintings of Whistler and the nocturne paintings. And the foreground branch uh, echoes those found in Japanese prints much in vogue in the early uh, turn of the century Paris. Yet his subject is really distinctly American and modern. The newly completed 24-story skyscraper, the Flatiron, of course, which still stands today, soars so high above Madison Square in New York that it, could be, it couldn't be contained within uh, Steichen's uh, frame. Three variant paintings of the Flatiron uh, were the crown jewels in the New York Mets photography collection, each with a different tonality, evoking successive moments um, uh, of twilight and asserting the photography rivals painting and scale color, individuality and expressiveness. This is really a beautiful photograph that uh, I particularly like and is very famous. Here's the great Garbo, um, 1929, Greta Garbo, a famous actress in her definitive five minute, minute sitting for Steichen on the set of her famous film, A Woman of Affairs in 1928. The cat, look, this classic frame was composed as Garbo pulled back her hair while complaining, oh, this terrible hair. The photograph rocketed her to fame. This is Amelia Earhart, 1922. Six years after this portrait was made, she became the very first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and would then disappear over the Pacific. And this portrait, among any others, became the most beloved image of Amelia after she vanished. Really a beautiful portrait of her. And this is one you may have seen, the, the famous Gloria Swanson in 1924. The photograph was a result of sitting for Vogue. 
uh, magazine. Um, he said, the day I made this picture, Gloria and I had a long session with many changes of costume and different lighting effects. And at the end, I took a piece of black lace veil that I had hanging around and I put it in front of her face. And I thought she looked like a leopardess lurking behind leafy shrubbery, watching her prey. And I took the image. It really became the most celebrated portrait of the 20th century and remains captivating nearly 100 years after its making. And it's probably the one picture of Gloria Swanson most remembered uh, of, of in, 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 her, in history. We'll move on to uh, another great photographer, Edward Weston, really um, had been called one of the most innovative and influential photographers in the world and is really the master of 20th century photography. Over the course of his 40 year career, he photographed an expansive set of subjects, landscapes, still lifes, nudes, portraits. He said, it, it is said about him that he developed a qu quintessentially American, especially Californian approach to modern photography. In 1937, he was the first photographer to receive a Guggenheim. And over the next two years, he produced over 1400 negatives with his big, huge eight by 10 view camera. He had two sons, Cole and Brett Weston, who became very famous photographers of their, uh, their own in Carmel, California, both of whom I had the great honor of meeting. This is nude Cheris. Santa Monica, 1936, a year before he and Cheris Wilson were married. He put his wife on a rug, one leg crossed majestically over the other with her arms encircling them and her head rests on her knee, parted hair directed at the viewer, her face obscured. Weston took this photograph and he later said, you know, I really never was happy with that shadow on her right arm. And Cheris said, oh, I just never liked that crooked part of my hair and those bobby pins. But despite the photographer and sitter's objections, the image has been declared by, uh, by the history as a modernist paragon for its extraordinary image of the human body. It's really one of his most famous images. Here's one called Shells, 1927, really an example of the pure or straight style that characterize Weston's still life photographs. It actually shows a Nautilus shell <clears throat> balanced with an abalone shell. There are two shells there. He photographed them using a long exposure time of several hours, a process that led to the intense contrast between the light and the shadow in the image and it remained probably his most famous image. That is until two years later when this came along. This seemingly boring picture of a red of a green pepper is probably his most celebrated, and it even has its own Wikipedia page. It was taken in 1929 called Pepper Number 30. He said, I placed it in the funnel, knowing just the viewpoint, recognize a perfect light, and I am made, made an exposure of several hours at F240 with the light shifting. F240. <clears throat> is a, a, a pinhole, which is like a small drill uh, that is put through a, a copper plate. It is so small, it lets in very little light and it allowed the several hours of exposure. Um, and he said, I have made a great negative, by far my best. The head of the Guggenheim later saw this and said, this is the greatest still life ever created in the history of photography. The interplay of light and shadow along the smooth, firm skin of the pepper defines the swelling, the swirling curves of its voluminous form. But Weston wasn't so impressed with that. He just said, this is nothing more than a pepper. And it, but it remains his most famous and most sought after photograph. And in fact, you can't even find it anymore. It's so obscure uh, and owned uh, in private collections. Now we move to my favorite. Uh, photographer, Ansel Easton Adams. Uh, this portrait, again, by Joseph Karsh that we'll talk about in a minute, wonderful photograph. Ansel Adams really was quite literally the most influential and beloved photographic artist and conservationist of the 20th century. He became a national institution 
even, even more than any of the other photographers that I just showed you. And even of those who were not familiar with Ansel, his magnificent black and white photographs inspired us. And his work elevated photography to a true art form more than anything else and influenced the future of nature conservationism, which ended up protecting parks in the West. He would spend his life trying to capture on film the wild majesty of the American continent. It's in his mind, it's sublime wilderness. And his photographic images would become the symbols, the icons of America. This uninteresting photograph that's very blurry was actually a snapshot taken by his wife, but it led up to one of his most famous photographs. This was in April 1927 in Yosemite Valley in California. And one day he and his followers set out to hike up what is called the diving board, which he's standing on right now, a tiny point of granite from which you can look up right into the sheer face of Half Dome above you. And on the way up, he took some pictures. Um, he had only one, two glass plates left. And re reminding people, these are view cameras that weigh probably 45 or 50 pounds each with heavy tripods. And he has glass plates that are light sensitive. He made his own plates because back then they didn't have negatives. And he puts uh, a glass plate into his camera and removes the slide and carefully composes this on the ground glass and he clicks the shutter of the photograph that he later called monolith, the face of half dome. And this is the image he took. And he suddenly thinks, you know, this picture I just took when I printed, it's not really going to translate or communicate to people what I'm really feeling as I'm standing right here. He thought it would be much more faithfully rendered if he put in a heavy red filter, Rattan A filter, which would radically darken the blue sky and make the face of the cliff darker. And the result is this. The image has power and drama and majesty. And it's really all the things that he's feeling about this incredible granite monolith that's in front of him. And there's a sense almost of terror and the enormity of the slab. For the first time, he later said he had found a way to make a mountain look like it feels, a huge monumental thing. And it came to represent a moment when he had made the great leap forward in terms of the notion that pre-visualizing what the print should look like and thinking about how to produce the negative in a way that would achieve that pre-visualized idea. It was a major turning point in photography. And this particular image stands as one of his five most famous photographs. Then one day uh, in November, literally almost 79 years ago today, when driving through New Mexico in the Northern part of Mexico, he came across a sleepy village in the last light of day. In the foreground were tw tiny pueblos and a church with gold crosses from its cemetery, illuminated brightly in the setting sun, a long field leading up to a distant snow-capped mountains that are rimmed with bright clouds, and a glowing moon floating alone in the sky. He made the most powerful haunting photograph of his career. And this was you have to understand in the midst of a long photographic assignment that day, and he's photographing every day, he's working for the government, uh, documenting parks and, and uh, uh, famous buildings. And that heavy eight by 10 view camera, it becomes second nature to him, but he can't find his light meter. And he has to guess the exposure based on the light of the moon reflecting what he remembered as 250 candles per square foot and he made the exposure and he said, realizing as I released the shutter that I had an unusual photograph which deserved a duplicate negative, I swiftly reversed the film holder, but as I pulled the slide out to make the image, the sunlight passed from the right crosses. I was seconds too late. So he only had the one image. So this is Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico, 1941. And the original image looked just like this when he first printed it in late 1941. But again, as in the monolith image I just showed you, he pre-visualized pre it as more dramatic as he saw it and printed it with greater contrast to accentuate the moon and the crosses lit by the sunlight. And this was the result. This gorgeous, 
gorgeous photograph. And over nearly 40 years, he reinterpreted this moonrise image and made over 1300 unique prints. And many of the prints were made in the 1970s and sold and actually gave Ansel Adams finally financial independence from all of his commercial work. And the total value of all these original prints today reaches more than $25 million. The highest price ever paid for one of these images of Moonrise was a 16 by 20 inch print in 2006 at Sotheby's for $609,600. That necessarily makes the photograph great, but it was so popular and still is today. Here's another great photograph of his called Clearing Winter Storm, Yosemite, early 1940. Uh, this particular scene was, uh, he was living there. So there was a big storm that blew through and it started clearing out and it, it changing rapid uh, um, lighting and he had to make rapid decisions and he focused on the foreground trees, ended up lengthening the development of the negative which gave the otherwise gray uh, low contrast scene, a dramatic look. Later in life, uh, numerous of, uh, pieces of uh, Clearing Winter Storm were sold at auction, including a mural size print, which sold at Sotheby's, New York, in 2010 for $722,000, which was the highest price ever paid for an Ansel Adams photograph, and one of the highest ever paid period for any photograph. This is called Tetons and the Snake River, 1941, which was in the Northwest Wyoming's Grand Teton National Park. This particular photograph showcases the beauty of the Teton National Range and the Snake River before it and highlights Adam's mastery of composition because the river is like a path leading to the focal point of the far Teton Range. The image was made uh, for the government called the Mural Project and became the property of the government uh, later and a 16 by 20 print sold for $450,000 in 2009. More than its sheer beauty, this photograph shaped the way Americans thought of the American wilderness and was when it, one of many uh, images that Ansel made that was used by Congress that helped to protect our parks that later led to the National Wilderness Act in the 1960s. Ansel was responsible for that. Ansel didn't take many portraits, but in 1977, he made this wonderful, striking portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, her artistic mastery and his wonderful photographs forged a close relationship that made, made a major force in his life until his death in 1984. But I like to show it because it, many people haven't seen this image. Let me move on to a really remarkable photographer I'm sure that many of you have heard of called Dorothea Lang. She was best known for her work during the 1930s with Roosevelt's Farm Security Administration. And she studied photography at Columbia University and then went on to a successful career <clears throat> as a portrait photographer in San Francisco. But in the midst of the Great Depression in the 1930s, she brought her large Grayflex camera out of the studio and onto the streets and began to create what is now known as the most iconic images in the history of photography. Lang's photographs influenced the development of documentary photography and really influenced, um, and, I'm sorry, in, and humanized the consequences of uh, the Great Depression. So I'll show you some of her wonderful photographs that did this. This is Refugee from Draw Dust Depression, Sacramento, California, November 1936. This is Ruby, daughter of a migrant worker living in a camp near Sacramento. Her face shows the despair, the fatigue, and the hopelessness that bright life brought during the Great Depression and farm worker life. This is one of her favorite and most famous photographs called White Angel Breadline, San Francisco, 1933. It was taken just a few blocks from Lang's home in Berkeley, California on a morning photo shoot. During the Great Depression, Lang began to photograph unemployed men uh, standing in lines and wandering the streets of San Francisco. And pictures such as this showed the desperate condition of the men 
and the Republic exhibited and received immediate recognition from both the public and other great photographers. This particular, these photographs, and in this one in particular, led to a commission in 1935 from the Federal Resettlement Administration, which was ended uh, later called the Farm Security Administration. And here is another wonderful photograph of hers called Migratory Cotton Picker, Elroy, Arizona, 1940. This is a man resting in a wagon, cotton wagon before returning to work in the field. He had just been picking cotton all day. He only could earn $2 a day and he had to work 10 hours a day to do that. This is child and her mother in an FSA rehabilitation center in Washington, 1939. The poor girl had just had her one meal of the day and was feeling relaxed. Then in the March of 1936, Dorothea was driving north on Highway 101 through San Luis Obispo County, north of Los Angeles. And she spotted a sign for the migrant workers campsite. At the time, in North, it was in March, freezing weather had destroyed the local pea crop and the pickers were out of work. And many of them were on the brink of starvation and in great destitute situation. And she spotted a woman sitting in a tent with her children. She got out of the car and approached her and said later, I saw and approached the woman, the hungry and desperate mother and her children as if drawn by a magnet. She said, then I took several photographs, one of which ended up symbolizing the hunger the poverty and the hopelessness that endured by so many Americans during the 1930s and later became the face of the Great Depression. And this one image became the Great Depression. This is migrant mother. It is the most iconic photo in American history. A woman in rag clothes holds a baby as two more children huddle close to hiding their faces behind their shoulders, presumably they are embarrassed by the photographer, Dorothea, standing close to them. She squints into the distance, her hand lifted to her mouth, and anxiety etched on her face, deeply in the lines of her face. Just a really, really beautiful photograph, but so sad. And according to the migrant mother later, this is Florence Thompson, Lang promised the photos would never be published. But she did send them to the San Francisco News even before sending them to the Resettlement Administration as required in Washington. The news ran the pictures almost immediately and reported that almost 4,000 migrant workers were starving in Napomo, California. Within days, the pea picker camp received 20,000 pounds of food from the federal government to help these people. And this one photograph pushed the FSA, the Farm Security Administration, to create government camps and farm workers, uh, camps for the farm workers. Uh, while Thompson's identity, uh, uh, Florence Thompson's identity was not known for over 40 years after the photographs were taken, the images became famous. And this particular image achieved near mythical status, symbolizing, if not defining, an entire era the head of the FSA called Migrant Mother the ultimate photo of the Depression era. Lang never surpassed it. She is immortal for this. Migrant Mother now hangs in the Library of Congress and it is the most reproduced photograph in the world today. One can't really um, present Dorothea Lang without Walker Evans. Uh, he influenced an entire generation of photographers and is best known for his collection, a collaboration with James A.G. on the famous book, Now Let Us Praise Famous Men, the book that illustrated the plight of tenant farmers during the Depression. His photographs from Southern sharecroppers to New York City writers, um, New York City subway writers, are really point of view images that reflected the, his distinct vision of America. And I'll show you some of those images. This is a very famous photograph called Sharecropper Bud Fields and his wife Ivy and his mother and children. This is Hale County, Alabama, 1936. And it captures the bleak living conditions of the sharecroppers in the American South during the uh, Depression era. It was really one of the only images ever taken inside uh, of one of their homes. 
it, 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 it was really became famous. This is Floyd and Lucille Burroughs, Hale County, Alabama, 1936, the portrait of a father and the barefoot daughter, a real superb example of the dignity and austere beauty that Evans uh, discovered in the lives of these ordinary farm workers. And millions of dollars was donated to, fund, to help fund these people, these sharecroppers from this one photograph. Now we'll move on to uh, one of my favorite photographers, Josef Karsh, an Armenian Canadian photographer known for his portraits of very famous people. He has been described um, by many as one of the greatest portrait photographers of the 20th century. He captured the private personality and public persona of his sitters by carefully posing and sensitively lighting a subject. He photographed them all using a really large eight by 10 view camera and, and studio lighting. He strived to highlight the distinctive features that would convey a sense of their individuality and inner life. And the decisive moment for him and the moment when which we'd release the shutter was when his subject public mask was lifted if only fleetingly. And I can tell you from discussions I've had over the years with photographers in California who knew him, that he would go into people's homes and spend literally days and sometimes weeks with these people, getting to know them, their family, their children, their pets, uh, all about them in their lives so that he could make the portrait really meaningful. Well, I'll show you a few of his great portraits. This is the wonderful Albert Einstein taken in 1948. <clears throat> it was taken at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. He said, <clears throat> I found Einstein a simple, kindly, almost childlike man, too great for the, any of the postures of eminence. One didn't really have to understand his science to feel the power of his mind or the force of his personality. But the photograph is such a beautiful, simplistic image of a man. Here's Ernest Hemingway. 1957, Karsh said, I expected to meet in the author a composite of the heroes of all of his novels, but instead in 1957 in his Havana home, I found a man of particular and peculiar gentleness, the shyest man I ever photographed, a man cruelly battered by life, but seemingly invincible and beautiful. This is Pablo Casals, the great cellist in 1954. Um, Karsh said in the Abbey de, uh, Abbey de Cruxa in Paradis, I spent several glorious hours with a master of the cello. I've never photographed anyone before or since with his back to the camera, but it seemed right with the light coming through the window. The photograph catapulted Casals to even greater fame and became his most favorite. This one I particularly like because of the dog. Uh, this is Benjamin Britten, a central figure in 20th century classical music. Karsh said, his dachshund wouldn't allow me to take more than a few photographs of Britten in his house alone by the sea in Suffolk, England. The dog demanded to become part of the picture as Benjamin poses by his famous opera Gloriana. Joseph Karsh tells the story of photographing Winston Churchill. He said, he stepped into the studio stunned by all the lights and the large camera and said, what is all this? And he said, I hope, sir, that I will be fortunate enough to make a portrait worthy of this famous and historic occasion. Churchill had just delivered a speech after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So he lit a fresh cigar, puffed on it with a mischievous air, and then relented, okay, you can take just one. And Karsh took this photograph, Churchill smiling, enjoying the cigar smell in the room. The cigars were always present with, with uh, Churchill. And Karsh held out an ashtray, but he wouldn't dispose of it. And he said, as I went to my camera to make sure everything was all right technically, I waited and I waited and he continued to chomp vigorously on a cigar. I waited again and then I stepped forward towards him and without premeditation, I said, forgive me, sir. And I plucked the, photo the cigar from his hand. And by the time I got back to the camera, he looked so belligerent, he could have devoured me 
Mr. Churchill said, you may take one more. You may even make a roaring lion stand, uh, stand still to be photographed. And in the archives of Karsh, this photograph of Winston Churchill is filed under Roaring Lion. He said, my portrait of Winston Churchill changed my life and philosophy. I knew after I took it, it was a special image, but back in 1941, I would have hardly dreamed that it would become the one of the most widely reproduced photographs in history. This photograph and Churchill's subsequent speeches and leadership made him the most famous statesman in history. In, in 2013, in fact, the Bank of England announced that this portrait would be featured on the five pound note, which it uh, is featured today. So in the era of portrait photographers, one stands out as a great Arnold Newman is noted for his environmental portraits of artists and politicians. Uh, he found uh, his vision and the empathy he felt for the artists and their, and their work. Although he photographed many personalities like Marlena Dietrich and John Kennedy and Harry Truman, he maintained that even if the subject was not known or was already forgotten, the photograph itself must still excite and interest the viewer. Newman set a standard for artistic interpretation, and he is often credited with being the one photographer who articulated and constantly employed the genre of what they called the environmental portrait, in which the photographer uses a carefully framed and lit setting and its contents to symbolize uh, the individual's life and, its, and, and, and work. And this one is Salvador Dali, 1951. Um, one of Newman's strategies was to place the sitters in front of his own work. They seem to be saying, look at my work, this is it. Here is a portrait of Pablo Casals that he took in 1954. And this one I love is Ansel Adams, 1975, outside of his darkroom in California, where I stood and talked to the man and knew that area very well. <clears throat> and this remains um, one of his most famous images, the mid 1940s portrait of Igor Stravinsky that was commissioned by Harper's Bazaar. The portrait poses the 20th century composer in the far left corner of his piano. And here Stravinsky is an extension of the instrument. The piano is dramatically silhouetted, con 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 uh, complementing the, the composer's great legacy and his connection to music. Really a beautiful photograph, it's probably his most famous. And one can't really discuss environmental or any kind of portraiture without talking about the famous Richard Avedon. For, the, for 50 years, his portraits filled the pages of books, magazines, and been the subject of numerous documentaries, one very famous one I'll talk about in a minute, and it stirred people all over the world. He became the first staff photographer for The New Yorker. And he famously said, all photographs are accurate, but none of them tell the truth. This is one of my most favorite images that he took uh, in Central Park in uh, 1965 of the great Bob Dylan in which looking at it, the musician has this glorious presence when you, when you look at it, it's almost emanating a metaphysical aura about it. This is the great Marilyn Monroe. Avedon apparently walked around with her in a studio pressing the shutter again and again as the actress was charming and gallivanted around. Only hours later, when the mask was dropped, he got the photograph he wanted, the vulnerable woman. At the moment, he asked her about dying, and this was the result. Avedon saw this and remarked, oh, I think she might end her own life. And she did four years later. This is portraits of the famous series, The American West. Avedon said, you don't have to have a studio, you can just go right outside. He wanted his light to be invisible and he ultimately opted for open shade and he chose a white background which eliminated the distractions and pulled the focus to the subject, their expressions and gestures, the details that otherwise might be overlooked. These are small, but I've seen these originals uh, in a gallery that are magnificent photographs and they're several feet high. They're just gorgeous images. This is, um, uh, the great um, 
the great Audrey Hepburn, Hollywood presented a fictional account of Abaddon's early career in the musical in 1957 called Funny Face. And it featured Fred Astaire as the fashion photographer, Dick Avery. Abaddon supplied some of the still photographs used in the production, including its most notable single image, this intentionally overexposed close-up of Audrey Hepburn's face in which her notable features, her eyes, her eyebrows, her mouth are really featured. Actually, Hepburn was a Avon's muse in the 1950s and 1960s, and he was secretly in love with her. And he went so far as to say, I am and I ever for well, well be devastated by the gift of Audrey Hepburn before my camera. I can't lift her to greater heights. She's already there. I only record that greatness. I can't interpret her. There is no going further than who she is. She has achieved in herself the ultimate portrait. This photograph catapulted Hepburn's fame to great heights in the 1950s. And if we talk about portraiture, we have to talk about the great Annie Leibovitz, which is uh, a woman known for her wonderful engaging portraits, particularly of celebrities, which often features subjects in very intimate uh, settings and poses. And one of her earliest images was this. Um, the Rolling, it turns out on the Rolling Stones cover of John Lennon curled around Yoko Ono. And it was shot only five hours before he was shot to death in front of uh, his building in New York. And it became iconic. And a month or so later, Rolling Stones magazine gave their greeting fans his last image. The rock music uh, uh, magazine's then chief photographer, Annie Leibovitz, I mean, she was then, then the, the head of uh, Rolling Stone, called it the photograph of my life and the photograph she would be remembered for. Lennon had seen it moments after she had taken it and said she captured our relationship exactly. Leibovitz later moved to Vanity Fair and shot for Vogue, developing a large body of work in her uh, trademark portraits. This is Leo with a swan. This is actor Leonardo DiCaprio, and one of the many hot throbs and as a young boy, uh, Annie Leibovitz has sh uh, shot. And she said, swans are such romantic birds and this image looks so charming of a handsome young man with a beautiful bird. This is Meryl Streep in 1981. Leibovitz said, she came into my studio and there were a lot of clown books lying around and some white makeup left over from an idea I had for either James Taylor or John Belushi. And I told Meryl that she didn't have to be anybody in particular. And I suggested maybe she put on white face, become a mime. That set her at ease. And she had a role to play. It was her idea to pull at her face like this. This became the basis for the Rolling Stones cover that showed how versatile and adaptable she was in different roles hence pulling the face uh, like she is. And this ended up being the cover of Vanity Fair in 1981 and its most famous cover. Leibovitz actually became so famous for her portraits that Disney commissioned her to show very famous movie stars in Disney fairy tales. This is Jeff Bridges and Penelope Cruz as Beauty and the Beast. There are many other beautiful ones. But Leibovitz really became famous for her portraits of Queen Elizabeth. Um, 11 assistants were needed to make this image. The woman, the, the, uh, the queen came in wearing full regalia, including the tiara. And as Leibovitz was ready to make the image, she looked at the queen and said, I'm going to make a last minute change. Let's remove the crown. You look so much better and less dressy. Less dressy, the queen replied with annoyance. What do you think this is? The crown state. And this image was made, probably her most, for, most famous and formal, but she made many informal portraits. And this is one of the queen's favorites uh, outside of Buckingham Palace, beautiful sky, really gorgeous. And this is my particular famous uh, favorite, which is the queen on the steps of East Terrace at Windsor Castle. <clears throat> and in the, um, the caption of the image, the queen insisted that all of her dogs were named. And from the top to the bottom is Corgi Willow, Dorgi Vulcan, Corgi Hollow at her foot, 
and Dorgy Candy, which I thought was very amusing and really a beautiful photograph. But one photographer you probably have never heard of is Steve McMurray. And why is he here? He was an American photojournalism who was photographed for National Geographic and very remarkable, but there were many of them. But he made one very famous image that you uh, will recognize that we'll see that catapulted him to fame. He's really most famous for photographing uh, people uh, over uh, other other countries um, that were um, uh, that were illegal to go into, and he got smuggled over the border into rebel-controlled Pakistan and other countries, and made some of these images. And he returned with reels of films hidden in his clothes, containing the first images ever pub published. Um, that internationally depicting the conflict and, uh, the, and, and in the faces of the people, particularly in the faces of children. And here are some of them. This is uh, children of India, Yemen, and Afghanistan. And in 1984, he visited an Afghan village where children were attending school. And there he photographed one girl that became the most recognized photograph in uh, the magazine's history and later in the history of photography. This is Afghan Girl, 1984. And the photo was immediately called the first, the first Third World Mona Lisa and became a symbol of Afghanistan to the West. Known for her intense stare and bold green eyes, Afghan Girl came to symbolize the struggles of refugee women in the Western world. The girl's name is Sharbat Gula and she was 12 years old at the time. And in 1985 in June, it became the cover of National Geographic. The image of her face and stark eyes staring directly at the camera was named the most recognizable photograph in the history of the magazine and the cover of Nas uh, National Geographic became famous. The image of the Afghan girl has its own Wikipedia page and inspired poems, a book and a song called Afghan Girl by a metal band in Europe. McMurray said, 17 years later, I went looking for her and I was reunited with her and it was extraordinary. I was thrilled that she was still alive. Gula didn't know that her picture had been published at all all over the world and she was in time understood it. Um, she remembered that I took her picture that day because it was the first time in her life she had been photographed. The second time was right here when she was reunited with, with Steve. It was crucial for her because it wasn't welcome for a girl of Pashtun culture to reveal her face and make eye contact and be photographed by a man who does not belong to her family. Very interesting story about her. But to take a shift here, really, in the history of photography, recording significant worldwide events, really, I think nothing surpasses the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic that we're all in the middle of right now, which in a very short period of time, just months, has produced many memorable photographs of heartbreak and of horror and of hope. The world looks very different during a pandemic. And the first image I show you is what has caused this. This very first and now famous colored a uh, micro photograph is called a transmission electron micrograph that was captured the first coronavirus particles. They're named after the corona, the crown of the surface proteins, these outer dots that are used to penetrate a host cell. And as beautiful as this image is, it stands for something really horrible. Here is very uh, um, newlyweds, Allah and Mosdi kissing through protective masks after their wedding. This is in Lithuania's lockdown where there is no people in public gatherings and they're the only two getting married except for a distant preacher who, who married them. Here is members of the Serbian army preparing makeshift hospitals uh, capable of holding 3000 patient, uh, patients with COVID-19 infections in an exhibit hall in Belgrade. Many countries around last March, including Italy, Iran, and the United Kingdom, had to set up such, such <clears throat> temporary medical facilities in public places to ease the pressure on existing hospitals. A number of cases began to arise, and unfortunately, this is happening right now. And with people sheltering at home and off the streets, animals began to gather everywhere. 
And here, a rare photograph of Kashmiri goats seen on the streets of the town in Wales. People in Wales never see them, and they started to gather, looking for food, not uh, not afraid of the uh, 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 anymore because there are no people. The isolation is shown here by Andrew Kelly of Reuters, a, a wonderful photograph of Times Square in March 2020. And Andrew Kelly was also then called by the New York City Ballet and uh, to make this image, which I think is very amusing. This is New York City Ballet performer Ashley Montague dancing in Times Square with a mask in New York. Also uh, a photograph by him, and it, it's uh, really uh, you know comical but sad at the same time. This is a, an image made um, uh, showing the pandemic is everywhere. Thai Buddhist monks wearing their face shield as they walk to collect alms from the devotees in Bangkok, Thailand, in March, with their dog Monkey, a constant companion of the monks. And this is um, a photo of the famous French uh, tenor, Stéphane Senegal, singing the French national anthem from his apartment window in Paris in March, 2020, with a small audience properly social distance. And finally, this is uh, Rajin Kadad's photo of nurses physicians and police officers in Mumbai, India, showered with flower petals by helicopter to thank them for handling the country's COVID-19 cases. So I think this image shows there's really a spirit in the people throughout the world. And this photograph really captures that. So I leave you uh, with a photograph that did not define an era or start a movement, but is simply just sheer beauty. This is an incredibly magical night photograph in Northern Norway, taken by a Hong Kong based photographer, Kevin Yuen, who ends up being the current international landscape photographer of the year and he is the top rising star in digital photography in the world. So I thought when I looked at this, it's almost like we've come full circle with photography imitating art, as if this image almost looks like a painting but it's really not in all the digital effects like the pictorialist once used, leave us with this gorgeous image. And I leave you with that and I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. I found this fascinating um, and your uh, choice of photo photographs was ama is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have, one question to start in the chat uh, box. Um, the de the de depression mother, um, do we ever find out what happened to her and her family? Yes, actually, there's a whole story about her. If you um, type into Google uh, migrant mother, uh, you will find a story all about Florence Thompson, what happened to her, where she lived, what happened. I mean, I remember one very interesting detail is that um, she got a lot of money eventually from uh, people who donated uh, to her family and her and wanted to buy her a beautiful new house and she refused. She wanted to go live in the trailer she lived, was living in. She couldn't stand living in anything fancy after the years she had lived in such a depre depressed area, era. But I don't know, she's not alive today, I don't think, but there's a whole Wikipedia page about her. Okay, good to know. Um... Okay, feel free to uh, type questions in the chat box. Um, I'm, I was just um, noticing that before you got to Annie Leibowitz, um, all of the photography is in black and white. Yeah. Um, and I, I've always found black and white to be so timeless. I mean, is that the preferred, um, is that preferred by photographers for, and what for what reason? Well, <clears throat> Many of the photographers that I showed you, they didn't have color film back then. Wow. And uh, the colored images, for example, the Flatiron Building by Steichen were colored artificially. Um, they were not made by color film. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, uh, and many of them, like um, later, uh, such as Avedon and Arnold Newman, were 
uh, black and whites were preferred uh, uh, by them uh, because it eliminated, the color eliminated any other influence. They wanted, you know, just the subject to come through and they preferred the black and white. And of course, Ansel worked exclusively in black and white, although he did take some color images, but none of them were very, uh, he, he never liked it. And none of them ever became very famous, but most of them preferred the, the timelessness uh, and the beauty of, of black and white. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, we have a, a comment here. Amazing talk and photographers. Is there a nearby gallery of photography that we could visit without traveling to Boston or, or New York City? Well, there's the Southern Vermont Art Center, which um, may not have photography exhibits at the moment, but uh, I don't know, maybe you know of others. I think there are some galleries in town, aren't there? Gal uh, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think that the Art Center at the at the moment, I believe does have a photography. Yeah, yes, they do have a photography exhibit at the Wilson yeah. Museum. I think it's, I think it's still up anyway. But the gallery downtown, I forget the, um, I forget the name of it, um, has some really fabulous, or it had some really fabulous, very large photographs of um, images of Vermont um, by a well-known photographer. Um, and I can't think of his name, but the Heimholtz Gallery, I think it's called. Oh, Helmholtz. Helmholtz, Helmholtz Gallery, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good place to go. That's just downtown, uh, in the main part of town. Yep, that's right. Um, could you explain the process of altering a photo to en enhance its significance, meaning, or beauty, both technically, artistically, and ethically? Can I explain the process? process of Yes, process yeah. of altering a photo. Well, as I mentioned, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> pictorialists used a wide variety of techniques. Um, you know, smearing Vaseline on the lenses, scratching the negative, um, but also inventing new techniques. And there were many of them uh, in which the image could intentionally be altered by using. Uh, an exacto knife, uh, uh, brush strokes, um, and other other you know physical means to alter the image to make it look more like a painting. And I showed you one um, of the of the portrait um, that used gum bichromate, which was a process in which the chemicals on the negative on the on the print could actually be painted around and you and, and almost like brush strokes. Um, there, there were many, many different um, um, types of, um, and I'm trying to think of some of them, of types of processes that photographers used back then uh, that really made the image look like a painting. And, um, uh, you know, photogravure, which you could look up, uh, it, it's an Italian, um, thing that in which they use copper plates and they can manipulate the image by using um, etched plates and moving the chemicals around on the plate um, uh, to make it uh, dreamy with this dreamy quality that um, Stieglitz um, often used and Steichen used. Um, so actually, if you type into Google pictorialism, you'll find a lot of the techniques that they use to, uh, to alter the photograph to make it look like a painting. Um, and some of them are absolutely beautiful. Um, they're really, really beautiful images, uh, but I can't discuss all of them because there were so many. Um, and many photographers today still use them uh, because uh, they love the quality of, 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 the, of, of the image it produced. Okay, we have a, a question from Richard. Why did you start your great presentation with the Times Square photo? And he notes that his birthday is August 14th, the date of the photo, <laughs> and mentions there's a, there is a 20-foot uh, statue of this in Sarasota, Florida. Oh, well, there's also one in Times Square. Uh, well, I knew it was your birthday, so I wanted to start it with that. <laughs> I didn't start that for any reason. I actually had a list of over 100 photographs that were iconic over the history of photographer photography <clears throat> that I could have used and I chose those. 
I chose that one in particular because it became so famous uh, and was so spontaneous and became the face of World War II ending. It really was the face of the war ending. And I wanted to show that first because it was so famous. Okay, have you been, uh, this is from Anne Graham. Have you been following any photographers who are chronicling the political divisions in the country? I, I, I don't do that, but no, I'm not. Sorry. Okay, uh, from Janet, um, are you going to give other classes um, on this space? Am I going to give other classes um, on this space? You mean on in space? Zoom, I guess? Yeah. Well, no, not unless Gloria wants one. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, we, we had a talk, um, we've given a couple of times um, on Ansel Adams in particular and some of his great work, which, some of which I presented here. But uh, no, we don't have. Um, I don't have any plans to do anything right at the, right right at the moment, but uh, oh. it would be it would be through the Green Mountain. Uh, okay. We we will talk. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, Chris Anderson says that the photographic work of Adrian Br uh, Bloom Broom it might be Broom is on display at um, the Southern Vermont Arts Center until November twenty ninth. And it is intriguing, and I have to say, yes, it is. It is a wonderful um, photographic um, display. Well, I'll go see it. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. Well, unless we have anything else, um, I think we can. I think we can finish here. So I just want to uh, thank you again, Chris, for um, a really fascinating. Um, program here. And I also um, would just like to th uh, thank everyone for joining us. So good night, everybody. Good night.